Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirabbilalamin. Wa sallallahu ala sayidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. As-sadatu wa sayyidatul hudur. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yasuruna an nurahhib bikum fi mu'assasat Taba wa bi hudurikum hadhihi al-layla min ajli al-muhadara allati uliya mawdu'uha al-kathira min al-ihtimam mu'akharan. ولا يزال يسترع اهتمام كثير من الناس وقد قررنا هنا في طابة أن نتناول هذه المسألة لعدة أسباب منها أن كثيرا من القضايا في المنطقة اليوم لم يعد تأثيرها منحصرا في مجال واحد إنما تؤثر بطرق مختلفة على شتى مجالات الحياة الاجتماعية والسياسية والدينية والاقتصادية ومن ثم فلا بد أن تكون حلول هذه المشكلات ذات جوانب وأبعاد متعددة وهذا لا يتعتى ما لم يوجد سعي للخلوص إلى تشخيص مشترك لهذه المشكلات يجتمع من أجله السياسيون والمفكرون والأكاديميون وعلماء الدين وغيرهم للنقاش والمداولة والحوار للوصول إلى صورة الكاملة بخصوص ما يجري وإن وجود دكتور ديفيد ماليت هنا هو من أجل أرض وجهة نظر أخرى حول مسألة خطيرة وهي الأسباب التي تجعل شبابا وشابات ينخرطون في متاهات صراعات خارجية فقد سببت هذه المعضلة عوامل دينية وسياسية واقتصادية واجتماعية على أن النقاشات الأخيرة تهيمن عليها عموما وجهة نظر السياسية حول القضية بينما تتميز جهود دكتور ماليت برصد سياق الصراعات الراهنة في المنطقة بما يقوم به من أبحاث منذ سنة 2005 ولذلك فإن بوصعه أن يقدم إطارا مرجعيا تاريخيا لقضية نشهدها في الوقت الحاضر وهذا العمل قيمته كبيرة وهو مع ذلك ضروري جدا دكتور ديفيد ماليت محاضر في العلاقات الدولية بجامعة ملبورن في أستراليا وكان في السابق مديرا لمركز دراسات الأمن القومي في جامعة كولورادو الحكومية وهو مؤلف الكتاب المقاتلون الأجانب فأود أن أرحب بدكتور ديفيد ماليت Shukran Abbas. Uh, thank you everyone to all the guests for coming tonight to hear my discussion and also I want to thank the Taba Foundation for its hospitality and bringing me to Abu Dhabi. The issue I, I'm going to speak about, the issue of, of people who go to fight in wars in countries where they're not citizens is not a new issue. Uh, the, the cover of my book from Oxford University Press is actually a propaganda poster from the communists in Spain in the 1930s during the Spanish Civil War. It, it pokes fun at the nationalist side, as they called themselves, for relying on so much help from volunteers from different countries. What I would like to talk about tonight is the fact that across these many different conflicts throughout history, there's a remarkable degree of consistency with how political movements bring people to fight for causes. I'm a political scientist, I'm, I'm not a, a scholar of religion. I, my work is on how political movements get people to participate and how they get them to take extreme risks and engage in very dangerous behavior to, to themselves and to others. What I'd like to talk about tonight is, is the consistent ways that these groups do this, a, a logic throughout them to, that we can see throughout history. We can learn lessons from history and apply them to problems today. But to speak about current issues first, I'd like you to imagine for a moment that there's a conflict in the world, which I think is, is well known, that has drawn volunteers uh, on both sides 
to, to fight for, for years now at this point. It, many of the volunteers who are fighting are there in the name of religion. They say that they're there for a group who is threatened, that it is up to them to fight because the government is not doing so on their behalf. They bring weapons with them, which they mix with religious symbols. And they come from not only from the region where the war is, but they come from Western countries as well. <coughs> what conflict am I talking about? I'm talking about the one that's being fought in Ukraine at the moment. You have volunteers on both sides. Uh, some not saying they're fighting on, that they are ethnic Russians from around the world who are fighting on behalf on, of fellow Russians uh, or, or against them because they are, they're Ukrainian or they believe that Russia should be stopped. You have others, uh, the, the two men in the woods, who are Serbian. Uh, the one on the horse is from Australia. Uh, the two men in the woods are, are Serbian and say they have to defend Orthodox Christian civilization represented by Russia. You can see that the, the religious icons, the Orthodox uh, Christian religious icons that they use with the weapons, you can see the, the, the poses that the fighters strike. In other contexts, it's easy to imagine them uh, for, for, for causes that receive more attention in the media. But I would argue that if we look at this case that's happening in the world right now, and we look at other cases in the world as well, again, we'll see that the, the motives of the fighters are similar, the, the means by the recruiters to bring them to the conflicts are similar. And what happens to them both in, in the war zones and after they return to their home countries is similar. And so we can apply these, these patterns to policy problems that, that seem new to us. But they're not when we have the proper context. I began my doctoral research on this project 10 years ago. Uh, at the time, surprisingly to me, there was not only no literature, no research on this phenomenon, there was not even a name for it. So I began to use uh, existing research. Oh, sorry. Before I, I say that, I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about what we know about the current conflict. So the, the estimates, I, I should say, that I began to do research on this, and there were, there were no number sets. Now we have different foundations, uh, different governments put out estimates of how many fighters you have in Iraq and Syria, but the data is still in very imperfect. Uh, researchers such as myself rely on media reports, rely on uh, public government reports, and yet when we, you speak to people who work on this issue within governments, the, report, the numbers that they use come from the, the very academic reports that, don't have, that rely on their numbers to begin with. So I, I compare this to a serpent eating its own tail. Uh, we have only rough estimates of, of numbers. So I'm going to present the, the estimates as of this past month that, that are used by some of the foundations that study this issue. I can't promise that these numbers are, are accurate. And even in the best documented cases where we have decades of, of information, we, we don't know exact figures. We never will know exact figures. But the best estimates are at the moment that there are th up to 30,000 uh, so-called foreign fighters in Iraq and Syria right now. And the very term foreign fighter is also can, uh, not a perfect term. Uh, it's one that typically describes someone who is not a citizen of the country where the war is being fought, who has traveled there from another country, specifically just for that war. The United Nations last year, the United Nations Security Council uh, introduced a resolution that called upon every member country to stop what it called foreign terrorist fighters, a, a new term that had not been used before in, in, in the research, uh, because I think because adding the term terrorist made it, uh, the ex activity unacceptable whether you agreed with a political cause or not. So ag again, these are always political terms that are being used, and, and, and they depend very much on the research that's being collected. So the, the going with the estimate of 30,000, uh, we know other estimates say that they come from, many of them come from this region. There are approximately, again, depending whose numbers you use, anywhere between 500 and 1,200 from Southeast Asia, from Indonesia and from Malaysia particularly. That there are over 3,000 who come from Western countries. The group that gets the most attention, of course, in the media is Daesh, uh, but not all of these 30,000 are with Daesh or, or even with other jihad groups. Perhaps about half of them are with the Sunni groups, the biggest two, but also a number of smaller groups as well. What receives far less attention is that an almost equal number are, are with Shia militia groups, mostly from the region, that come to fight against Daesh and other groups. 
You also have another faction, much smaller in number, but that's growing fairly rapidly. And that's uh, mostly Western volunteers fighting with Kurdish groups, fighting with Christian minority groups. They seem to fall into two categories. Originally, they were Marxists from Europe who had connections uh, with the Kurdish parties, like the PKK, Kurdish Workers' Party. More recently, you've seen numbers of evangelical Christians coming from the United States and from Canada who say that they are there to fight Daesh before it becomes a threat to Western civilization. They're so there, there are people fighting in the name of religion on, on every side of this conflict. And that's nothing new. We see in the historical cases that the successful recruitment of foreign fighters has often, in the biggest cases, led to recruitment on the other side, led to volunteers being told that you have to come in and stop them. The numbers that I found, start, starting from the beginning, uh, I had to look at existing research that had been done on, on civil wars. I looked only at people who were fighting for non-state groups, rebel groups, not for governments, not for militaries, uh, not for private companies that were employed by governments. And of more than 300 uh, civil wars over the last 200 years, it turns out to be surprisingly common for something that hadn't been studied very much, that more than one in five of them, more than 20%, uh, had had volunteers from outside. And these were just the cases that we could document. So we had seven, more than 70 cases. The numbers of foreign fighters have been increasing over time. I'll show you some uh, graphics on this in a minute. And we've also seen that they, they learn from each other. They learn tactics from each other over time. They tend to be more successful than insurgents that rely purely on local support. When I began this research 10 years ago, uh, it was very much in response to the war in Iraq at the time. What the earliest figures, the earliest studies showed us were that uh, there were fighters who were coming from countries around the world, not just countries in the region. Still, overall, they were a very small percentage of, of the fighters in the insurgency, but they were committing the vast majority of suicide bombings and the vast majority of other highly deadly attacks. Over the next couple of years, uh, the, the figures changed a little bit because local insurgents learned from them and began to adopt the more aggressive attacks. They, locals were committing more of the suicide bombings that they learned from the foreigners, but the, the majority were still committed by foreign fighters. And in fact, in late uh, 2007, uh, the United States military went to Sinjar and, and captured an insurgent office that had a lot of personnel files, had information about uh, it had mobile phone numbers, hometowns, contact information, and there were questionnaires asked fighters coming in from other countries, what job do you want to do here? And the majority of them said, I want to be martyred, I want to be a shaheed. So how do we explain this phenomenon? Uh, typically, political scientists who look at support activity in rebel groups say that people are motivated by greed. They want, they want to be mer you know, mercenaries in a way. They want to, to loot from their neighbor's houses that doesn't explain why somebody would go to another country to fight in their war. It doesn't explain why they would be a suicide bomber. One thing I should point out that's important to know is these patterns of very aggressive behavior by foreign fighters are not new. They're not unique to, to Iraq and Syria. We can see them in the historical cases as well. If we look at the, the biggest cases throughout history in the last 200 years where we've seen foreign fighters, where we've seen them engaging in, in the most deadly attacks and in, in, in suicide attacks, many of these cases have had nothing to do with uh, jihadi groups. Many times people say what is happening with Daesh is unprecedented, and in fact, we do have precedent. The civil war in Spain in the 1930s drew more than double the number of fighters who are in Syria and Iraq right now in under three years. On one side, they were there with the, the Communist International, sponsored by the Soviet Union, they were there, they said, to defend workers uh, against the rise of fascism. And, but the Communist Party did not want all of its members to be killed in Spain, so they, they framed the conflict. They, they said this conflict is not just for communists, it's about anyone who's threatened by fascism. They said this is about workers, uh, this is about religious and ethnic minorities, anybody who might be threatened by, by fascism needs to come, this is their fight. 
and, and they were very effective. They, they re recruited ten, tens of thousands of fighters, and it led to a response on the other side where people who, who felt threatened by the rise of communism were told, you have to stop communism. In particular, they had uh, Catholic Christian volunteers, uh, most of them from Ireland, who were told, this is the rise of communism. It has come to destroy your church. You must fight back now well, before it's too late. Some of the other cases, some of them still going on today in, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, involve ideological groups uh, across the political spectrum. A lot of these are ethnic causes as well, but the Rwandans who had been refugees for a generation who came back to Rwanda before the genocide fighting for Hutu groups. One of the cases, uh, Kosovar Albanians who, who fought uh, with the Kosovo Liberation Army in the 1990s, ha they happened to be Muslim, but they were secular. They were fighting for a purely ethnic cause. The, the 200 or so came from the United States, others from Germany, who've been living in diaspora communities there. So there's a, mo there's a wide range of motivations for different fighters, a, a wide variety of causes that, that have enabled recruiters to, bring, to tell people to put their lives on the line, to, to attack others. But the recruitment process is strikingly similar in every case, despite these differences. Just looking at the numbers, uh, the red lines are all of the civil wars over the last 200 years. The final one only goes until 2005, so it's not complete for the last decade or this decade. But the blue lines are the, the groups that had foreign fighters with them. You can see it's, it's increasing both in total numbers and also as a, as a percentage of the wars being fought. Here are a couple of charts. Again, on the upper one shows uh, the total number of civil wars. The lower one is the ones that had foreign fighters. This is broken down by region. And you can see those in, in, in this region, it's actually about the same. There's no special presence. There's no, there's no evidence that conflicts in this region draw foreign fighters in any greater number than other wars. It's actually in, in Africa uh, that you actually see a disproportionately high number of foreign fighters coming into conflicts. So why does this happen? Looking at the various cases over the past 200 years, dozens of, of instances, thousands of recruits, I make the argument that the one consistent pattern is that rebel groups tell volunteers that they are fighting a defensive battle. Even if they're winning the war, they tell them they're losing. How does this happen? It happens because Insurgent groups, militant groups, always start a conflict as the weaker side because they're not the state, they're not the government. They don't have the resources of the military, they don't have international recognition, so they seek external support to build their strength. Sometimes this support is forthcoming from other states who don't like the regime that they're fighting against, but other times they have to rely upon non-state groups, they have to rely upon communities with which they share some existing link of religion, of ethnicity, of ideology. They go to institutions around the world that have ties to these groups. Uh, these institutions are both the, the how and the why of recruitment, because they find that the people who are most receptive to the message are those who are already involved in these institutions, already derive a great deal of identity from these institutions, share their ideologies. And the recruiters find that the most receptive members of the audiences, the ones who become the foreign fighters, are ready to listen to a message, perhaps are already familiar with the conflict, that they've heard it on the media perhaps, but they tell them this is not just a distant conflict, this is not some civil war in another country somewhere else in the world, this is a broader fight for the very existence of our people. And throughout these historical cases, our people it could be Muslims, Jews, Rwandans, communists, it, it doesn't matter. They take the same argument every single time. They say, forget your country, that, that, that's not who you are. Who you are is this broader people, and we are, we are facing a, a threat to our very existence. So it is your duty to the group to come fight, and it is also in your self-interest, because if we, we will lose without your help, and when we lose, they will come for you next where you live, and you'll have to fight for your family in your own home and not in someone else's country. Who, who does this message appeal to? We have a consistent pattern about who becomes a foreign fighter that doesn't require the profile of any one particular group, any one particular religion or ethnicity or ideology. 
what we see are that the people who become foreign fighters are, are young, historically young men. There have been women who have become involved in these groups in the past as, as nurses, uh, as intelligence operatives in some cases, collecting uh, spy information. You're seeing now some of the, the Kurdish groups have recruited Western women who actually engage in combat operations, uh, women from the United States and Canada who have prior military experience. Uh, there's a different phenomenon with Daesh attracting women in other roles and families, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But typically, the volunteers have been young men, perhaps adolescents, university age. They've been getting younger in, in the past years in recent cases. They tend not to be from the poorest uh, segments of society. They tend not to be desperately economically poor. But many of them feel a sense of marginalization. They feel like they're not an accepted part of their society. In, in cases in Western countries and in Southeast Asian countries, uh, many of these people are immigrants, whether they came into that country themselves as a child or whether they were born there and their parents were immigrants. Uh, a lot of the time, that's the reason why they're minority groups. And they, they're not loners. They, they're very tightly connected within the communities of which they're part, but not within the broader national society. They don't identify with their country's citizenship. What we see in a lot of the historical cases, I haven't seen this information about fighters for Daesh or other groups today, but in a lot of the historical cases, we see high incidence of divorce with parents, uh, with families that are not fully intact, and with a, lot of the <clears throat> with a lot of the immigrant families, of course, you don't have extended family relations there with them because they're in another country. So to me, it seems logical that the organizations that these people join are, serve as surrogate families to them, and that's why these identities are so important to them, so meaningful to them, that they're willing to fight for them. Many of the uh, volunteers have some sort of criminal records in their past. In some cases, it's for participation in militant politics. But in other cases, it's simply for street crime. Uh, what we see then are, are some people who say that they are joining a cause to redeem themselves. They want their lives to have meaning. We can see this in the 1930s with people who joined communist causes, as well as people who are fighting today. And there's not a lot of psychological data available uh, about the volunteers, but there was one study in, in the 1930s that the American FBI uh, interviewed people who were coming back from Spain, who had fought with the communist groups there, and they found they were psychologically normal, but that many of them had very uh, narcissistic personality types. They had gone to Spain with the expectation they would be regarded as heroes for fighting, and they were very bitterly disappointed. They thought the locals in Spain were not grateful to them, uh, didn't appreciate them, and they wanted to come back, they, and, and they felt very aggrieved against the group. So narcissism might be a consistent uh, trait of, of people who become foreign fighters. We, we don't have the full information. Still, the cause always seems to matter. You, you very, you'll find individuals who have said, I went for excitement, I, I, I very rarely for money, because usually the groups don't offer to pay them very much, if anything. But you do hear recruiters always make reference to an ideology. And if it was simply about money, they wouldn't bother. They would say that there, there's money available. They wouldn't say, we're losing, which would make it less likely that the volunteers would be paid or survive to enjoy their payment. So why does ideology matter so much? Well, political scientists have been studying what ideology means. It's a term that we, we use on a daily basis, but what does it actually mean? To political scientists, ideology is a, a constellation or a cluster of your preferences on, on particular specific issues. And we arrange them in a way that helps us make sense of the world, helps us assimilate information about new issues that arise. What we've seen is, is that political ideologies in particular become very important to people during periods of social change. When, when they don't listen to old institutions, when they don't listen to traditional authority, they have ideological reasons that they listen to for how to explain the world. And it's, this also helps give them a sense of social purpose, a sense of social belonging to find with other people who share similar ideologies. It, it's not just their view of the world, it, it's a group that agrees with them. And so what, what seems like simply preferences on issues actually can provide a form of, of social meaning, much like ethnicity, much like a religious group would. It's very difficult to ask anybody, although there are people doing this right now with Daesh, uh, it's very difficult to ask anybody, why did you become a foreign fighter? There, there's simply, even if it's historical cases, and I interviewed people who fought decades ago in other wars, 
Uh, there are tim simply too many uh, incentives to lie. There are simply too many incentives at least to misremember some noble motive that wasn't there at the time. But what we can observe is the recruitment material that the recruiters used. It survives in the form of posters, more recently in the form of recordings. And we can see that the rationale that was offered by the recruiters to the recruits about why they need to fight, why them and not somebody else. And we can also hear if this is reflected back in, in the reasons given by recruits in their memoirs, and it is. I wanna show uh, first a poster that's almost 200 years old from the United States. Texas is a state in America today, but back in the 1800s, it was part of Mexico. It was a state in Mexico. And I'm not going to go into the long and complicated history of, of the Civil War in Mexico in the 1830s, but Latin America, Mexico, South America, uh, countries in, in Europe, it looked very much like the Arab region looked in, over the last few years. You had a series of different revolutions uh, in, the, in the name of democracy, uh, and some went better than others. In Mexico, you had several different states that were trying to break away from what they said was a military central government that was too strong. The only one that actually succeeded in breaking away was Texas. And the Mexican government had invited in settlers from different countries, from Europe, from the United States, to try to develop the region economically. And they had political discontents and, and they actually wanted to form their own country. They did this for several years before Texas ended up joining the United States. The initial reason for the rebels in Texas, the, the reason that they gave for others to come join them was they said they were believed in democracy, the Mexican government didn't, and it was fighting to stamp out democracy. And it was up to people like them who, who believed in, in democracy to, to come fight back. Otherwise the Mexican government, would, the Mexican army would come and take over all of America. This didn't actually get a lot of participation. Um, they, they had some recruits, but not that many. So very quickly, the, the rebel leaders in Mexico switched the framing that they used. They switched the message that they used about what this conflict was about. And they said, you know, this is really a case of Catholic, uh, Christian, Hispanic soldiers coming to attack white Anglo-Saxons. And they're coming for the women of the community. You must defend them. Uh, they're coming to impose Catholicism on, on Protestants, somebody, our, our fellow Protestants must, must help us. If you look at this particular poster, uh, it, it's actually early on at one of the, one of the bullet points uh, about this, this, this language that's very gendered about the young men need to defend uh, you know, the, the women and children of the community. This is something that we see in all of the cases, actually. Uh, again, if you're appealing to young men who want to be heroes, uh, th this language makes sense in a way. It's, it's something we've seen in other cases. It's something we've seen most recently uh, with the Sh Al Shabaab in Somalia, saying that Ethiopian soldiers are coming for the women. Somal ethnic Somalis must return home. You see, uh, even in the, in the United States, even in the 1830s, it was illegal to recruit foreign fighters. So you see messaging about, well, you can come get land. You can be a farmer if you come help us out. The Mexican government had already been offering land for free. It wasn't necessary to come and, and, and you know, fight to get land. And down in the, in the small print at the bottom, uh, there's some of the old language about de Democrats uh, being taken away in chains by the Mexican government. Somebody has to help them. The reason I like this poster, the, the reason I'm, I'm going into this history of, of the Mexican War, and, and I should point out uh, the fighters in the Mexican War, th there's a famous battle uh, of the Alamo. It, it, it's part of American political mythology that, that these few uh, farmers, 200 of them perished fighting back against 20,000 Mexican soldiers who were coming to, to attack them, that, that they died for freedom. Sorry, one second, battery's low. Okay, that they died for freedom, uh, they gave their lives in, in what today we would think of as a suicidal attack. And, um, you know, the, the interesting thing is only a few of them were actually from Texas. There were three times as many who were European nationals. Most of the rest had come only within a few weeks from the United States. They, they were foreign fighters, they were fanatical foreign fighters in every sense that we would think of today. What I like about this poster, and the reason I'm bringing all of this history up, is because it reminds me of another poster also used in the United States 150 years later for a completely different conflict. 
So the structure of the argument is identical. Uh, in some cases, foreign fighters don't have to make up the argument that there's a genocide going on, don't have to make up the argument that there are atrocities going on. In this case, uh, the, the, the message in, in the second bullet point about violations of, of women in the community was, was, was true. It was unfortunately very completely true. But you see the same argument used early on. You see the same uh, messaging used that if you, if you want to do more than just provide charity, uh, you know, help us out without being directly obvious about what, what they're saying, leaving some ambiguity. And then at the bottom, uh, some of the same messaging of transnational solidarity. We, we are one people. You, you must help out. And the same argument is, is used across cases. It's, it's used today uh, on all sides in Iraq and Syria. It's not just posters, though. Uh, I'll talk about social media in a minute. It's, it's received very, a lot of attention. But if we look at some of the other cases, some of the, the drawn thousands of foreign fighters in, in the past few decades, we see very similar appeals across different forms of media. Here's some more of the, the communist recruit uh, propaganda posters from the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s. Again, the, the messaging was not based on the opportunity to create a, a Marxist state. It was based on uh, that there, the term they use, criminals. Uh, you have to help Socorro Rojo, like, uh, you know, like, like the Red Crescent or the Red Cross. It was the communist version. You have to help civilians. The only way to do it is through the Marxist parties. Uh, the Spanish, they, they released movies. They, they didn't have the internet to provide videos online. So they, they used movies that the author, Ernest Hemingway, created a Hollywood film uh, trying to depict farmers who, who were being attacked. Uh, in the United States at the time, a lot, there, was, there was a big drought. There were a lot of farmers who were displaced. And it, it tried to show them that uh, there were people in Spain who were similar to them, who they could identify with, who were being attacked by, by the government, being attacked by the army. They should help them. This, this calendar in the middle, you know, again, that, that you can take rally to take political action to tell governments to lift an arms embargo against the Spanish rebels, that you can, you can not eat, you can fast, so that uh, your food can be given to people in Spain who need it. This messaging of solidarity, of sacrifice, it, it can be made appealing in a lot of different media. I'm going to skip ahead 10 years. Some of the volunteers in Spain, again, there were tens of thousands of them, so many of them survived, many of them learned from their experiences and moved on to other cases. Some of the participants in the Spanish Civil War became involved in, in the Zionist causes to establish a state uh, during and after the end of World War II. Uh, one thing I should point out about the recruitment messaging they used is that they, they never framed a positive opportunity. They never said we can create a Jewish state and what a great opportunity this will be. It was always a defensive messaging that if we don't act now, uh, the Holocaust under the Nazis will continue. It's a, the only way to establish a state is the only way to have security is to have the, sec the security of a state. So this was a, a Broadway play that they staged specifically as a fundraiser to raise money for, for arms to bring people uh, to, from Europe, uh, that they didn't say that they were raising money for military purposes, but that was probably implied. If you recognize some of the act, the, the actor holding uh, the flag is Marlon Brando, years before he became the Godfather. The same messaging was used in, a, in a, again a defensive sense. It was, it was necessary to, to fight back now, uh, defensively. And, and this messaging again it led to counter recruitment on the other side. Uh, there was a multinational Arab force that was formed that was very effective uh, for a time uh, to fight against th this force of, of uh, mostly Jewish diaspora volunteers. And um, th th that group said it was fighting for an ethnic Arab cause, not a, not a religious one. They claimed they said they were secular, that uh, they, they actually told some Western donors that, that you know, we'll ensure access uh, to Christians to holy sites. It was an ethnic conflict, not a religious one. But the, the messaging was the same as, as, as they framed it. So, the, but the messaging was the same. We're seeing this messaging reflected today in a couple of studies with interviews with fighters with Daesh. A, a team at Harvard University conducted SMS text message surveys with, with several hundred Daesh fighters. 
And they found that 70% of them, they asked them, why are you fighting? Why are your brothers fighting? And 70% said, I'm here to defend and avenge Sunnah, who are being attacked by the Assad regime and by, and by the West. Only 20% said, I'm here to establish a caliphate. A study that came out uh, actually just very recently with, by a French sociologist, in, he interviewed uh, some prisoners, Daesh prisoners who had been captured by the Kurds, maybe a, a dozen or so. And many of them said they had a religious motive in fighting, uh, that, they, that they were excited about to, the opportunity to establish a caliphate, but the ma majority of them said that they were there fighting defensively, that, that they, they understood that they had to fight back, and that's what had drawn them. So what is it that makes the, the Daesh so successful? What makes them different than, than other groups that they've drawn these, these rapid numbers so quickly, uh, the second largest in history? Well, they've taken a few, they've made a few innovations. The first is uh, this, this notion of family jihad that they've promoted. This is something new. As I've mentioned before, uh, typically you have young single men who have been fighters. In this case, uh, you have had women go with the notion of providing support, but you've had entire families recruited. This started with Chechen fighters uh, who, who came from Russia with bringing their entire families with them. And, and they were, had the most combat experience. They've been accorded special positions by Daesh because of, they have the combat experience and, and that many other volunteers do not have. So they were essentially allowed to do what they want. But there's been a value, even if it doesn't put women in fighting positions, there, there's been a value to the leadership of Daesh to, to encourage uh, women to go, something that Jabhat al-Nusra does not do openly. And that's, of course, providing logistical support. Uh, but there's also the idea that, that, that women are less likely to be stopped by law enforcement un until very recently, uh, particularly in Western countries, uh, in Arab countries, in, in Southeast Asian countries. The, women could bring resources with them that, that men might not be able to get through security. Uh, and of course, there, there's the notion also that you can provide service in, in more than one way. You can, you can marry a fighter. If you want to help the cause, you can, you can teach English in schools. This notion of, of a social project, this is something new. Um, there might be a precedent for this as well, which I'll talk about in a minute, but it's not something that we've studied previously. Why is ISIS effective? Many people are repelled by the tactics they use, the, the use of, of murder on, on videos on social media, but it's very strategic. Uh, there was a book that was written in, during the Iraq War in the last decade by one of the thinkers for Daesh, what would become Daesh, who made the argument that we don't have to win everybody's support, but that you have to show you're serious to the people who are likely to support you. If you can show them that you're making a difference, if you're showing them that you fight, you'll rally more, you'll get more attention and you'll rally more support, you'll rally financial donations, you'll rally volunteers who will come to you instead of other organizations. There's been a very strategic and deliberate use of brutality. And that's not unique to Daesh. That's, uh, there are a lot of studies of terrorist groups in recent years that show that they thrive on media attention. And of course, to get media attention, uh, you, you have to do something that gains attention. And there's an old saying in, in the United States uh, with the media that if, if it bleeds, it leads. So, uh, you know, uh, you, you stage one murder on, on video and everyone is horrified, but when they keep happening, people stop paying attention and you need to do something bigger to top it. So there's been a deliberate strategy of brutality. The notion of, of do-it-yourself uh, DIY revolution is also something that's very appealing. Under, under the Al-Qaeda model, uh, terrorism was a franchise. You could submit a proposal for some attack and if the leadership, the central leadership liked it, they would give you money, they would give you logistical support, but you had to get permission. You had to get approval. Something that's very appealing to the type of young people who get involved in these movements is the idea that you can make a difference yourself and any contribution you make is, is supported and is worthwhile. And if you can't come join us physically, uh, any attack you do at home, that's a contribution as well. So you don't get large scale attacks. You don't get the, the type of uh, simultaneous suicide bombings that you had under Al Qaeda. You can have knife attacks on the street. Uh, be, uh, post them to social media, and that's a contribution. That, there's, there's something that's easy to do about that, um, sadly, uh, that, that makes it appealing to, to just lone individuals to take up the cause themselves. 
one other one other innovation, if you want to call it that, uh, that was promoted by by then the Islamic State of Iraq the, uh, in the last decade was, was focusing on conflicts not between uh, Western countries or, or the Russians uh, and and you know and Arabs in, in, in this region, but focusing on conflicts that people experienced in, in Iraq and in Syria on a day-to-day -day basis on, on religious conflicts between Sunni and Shia Muslims. And some of the analysis about Daesh has said this is one reason why they're effective. It's not about an abstract fight about global politics. They're able to, to bring people in because of, of what they see as, as problems that they face on a daily basis politically, that somebody is fighting back against people who they see as oppressive, governments that they see as oppressive. The, this argument of creating a caliphate is, is actually a positive incentive that you get people now recording propaganda videos and from, who say they've come from Western countries not to be fighters but to be doctors, uh, that, that they are not that they're going to save people's lives uh, very directly, that, that you can join too, you don't, have to, you don't have to take up a gun, there are other contributions you can make. And this message is disseminated through social media, something that's gained a lot of attention about how Daesh, in particular, and Daesh is the most effective group using it. Uh, what is it about social media that, that draws so much attention? Well, I want to say first that, that social media, things like Twitter, is a medium. It's not a message. Nobody becomes a, a militant. Nobody kills somebody simply because they're on Facebook. It, it's the ideology that's being communicated in a way that's more effective than it has been previously that matters. What we're seeing today with, uh, with Daesh is, is something that's a relatively new strategy for groups with, that get foreign fighters. Historically, un unless it was a propaganda exercise like the communists recruiting the international brigades to, to prove that workers of the world were coming together in Spain, usually groups that recruit foreign fighters tend to play down their presence, tend, tend to hide them a bit, because they think it makes them look, it, they had thought it made them look weak or illegitimate somehow to have to rely on outside support. But this strategy changed very dramatically only five years ago uh, with Al-Shabaab in Somalia. There was a, a volunteer fighter for Al-Shabaab, an American named Omar Hamami, uh, whose father was a Syrian, uh, whose mother was an evangelical Christian from America. He, he'd been raised in America as a Christian but he, he wanted to explore his father's heritage and, and he drifted into radical politics, radical religion in, in, in the United States. He moved to Canada, he moved to Egypt, and eventually to Somalia. Omar Hamami was, was uh, very, he was not marginalized. He, he was very popular by all accounts in, in high school, in his community. Uh, he was very smart. He was, he was supposed to be a very smart kid. And he recognized the potential for social media. He was part of this millennial generation that is what they call uh, people born after 1980. What he began to do was to change the, the, the way that rebel groups look at foreign fighters. He took foot, footage that was videos recorded by Al-Shabaab of, of combat operations. He recorded his own rap music videos. He put them on YouTube and he said, look at me, look at some of the volunteers we have from other Western countries. He encouraged people in, in the United States where he was from, he encouraged uh, people in different Western countries. He said, you can stop living a marginal life. You, you don't have to live in government housing projects. You, know, you don't have to be, uh, waste your time on, on drugs. You can come fight and give your life some meaning, like me. And this is a tactic that was adopted by Shabab. It's been adopted since by Daesh. They take people from uh, Australia, from Canada, in this example this is an Australian, who have been, even who have been killed. And they say, here's somebody who gave his life and is now remembered as a hero. You can be as well. It's something that's appealing, I think, to people who, who feel marginalized and who want to give their lives meaning for, for a cause. And perhaps who are narcissists. There have been some studies of the use of social media by, by Daesh. And uh, it, it turns out that they employ full-time people who sit simply and, and retweet all day long to make it look like the presence is bigger than it actually is and to make uh, tweets come to the top of the deck and, and the same thing with Facebook. One thing that has changed uh, even with this inflation is that historically foreign fighters were recruited 
through institutions where they were members. If you came and said, I want to go fight, and that nobody knew who you were, you would not be trusted. You would be, you'd be turned away. Uh, in the communist case, the KGB would come after you. We have records of this. Today, people can become foreign fighters without ever actually meeting the recruiter in person because they can have uh, thousands of people, or, or maybe it's just a few people being retweeted. It's hard to tell these days. Uh, on social media telling them, yes, you're right, go fight, we all support you. So in, in effect, there are these virtual communities who, who tell them that they're making the right decision. There's also a message that, that has become somewhat different as well. The message of, of sacrifice is certainly part of the appeal, a sacrifice for a noble cause, but recruiters, especially in targeting volunteers from Western countries, make a, make a different argument as well. What they've been saying about Iraq and Syria, they've used the term, some of the recruiters on Twitter have said, this is a five-star jihad. This is not Afghanistan, this is not Somalia. You can come to Syria and we, we've captured, you know, nice houses from, from government leaders. You can have a video game room. You can have a swimming pool. Uh, all of your favorite Western snack food is available to you. And, and they get women uh, to, to recruit other women by, by saying you can have the same sort of things you would have at home in, in Western countries. You can have uh, pizza night. I'm cooking pizza tonight again with the kids. You can go on shopping trips. You can have nice cars. Life is not, not actually that hard. Um, and, and, and one thing, and, and no one has explained this one well to me yet, uh, but if you ever Google cats of jihad, uh, they seem to like to take pictures of themselves with posing with cats a lot to show, you know, we're, we're nice, we're, we're cuddly guys. Um, in a variety of different circumstances, they have cats. So why, why, is this, why does this work? Why, why do the cat pictures work? There's a lot of research about social media. And it's not necessarily research about violent groups, it's, but it's research about people who join political groups, uh, like globalization protesters. And what, what they say is that the millennial generation, the ones born after 1980, have come up, uh, come of age in an era where big institute, they've seen globally, they've seen big institutions fail. They, they were born after the fall of the, the, you know, the Berlin Wall and communism collapsed in their lifetimes. Uh, they grew up after the Watergate scandal in the United States. Uh, more recently, they've seen global banks fail. They don't trust formal institutions. They don't trust hierarchies. They don't trust political parties. They believe in making a difference in the world, but they want to do it uh, at a sm on a smaller scale. They want to do it, uh, believe that they can make a difference individually, and that those who they trust the most are their own peers. If a friend of theirs advocates for a cause, then it becomes legitimate. They can trust that person. They don't trust as much people from, from higher uh, spheres of authority. So the most effective form of transmitting information, whether it's marketing campaigns by private companies, or whether it's political movements, ideological movements, is to have an endorsement by somebody who you already know, who, and they can put you in touch, they can link you with, with friends of theirs. And that's actually how a lot of the recruitment is happening now. It's not strangers, it's not uh, an innocent person who's on the computer and begins to get radical messages. It comes from a friend of a friend. It spreads through social networks. So for all the cat pictures and for all the swimming pool pictures, uh, the reality is far different, of course, for, for most fighters in the field. I'm giving the figure of 30%. It's consistent with the reports that we've had from different governments about how many of their, their citizens have been killed in Syria and Iraq. It's also consistent across the historical cases I've examined, like Spain. It, it, it's still a rough estimate, but perhaps a third of them die in, on the battlefield. I've mentioned that there's an increasing use in suicide attacks. I, I should point out that the number who have become suicide bombers has actually dropped. It, it, it hit its high point in Iraq 10 years ago, and it's been decreasing. It, it, it's not as prevalent in Syria and Iraq today. But this doesn't mean that there aren't people used in suicide attacks. What we're seeing is especially with the younger people who come with no military skills, uh, no, no combat experience, and say, I want to fight, especially if they come from, from Western countries and are thought to be, thank you, Shifra, and, and, and are thought to perhaps to be spies, they're immediately sent out into dangerous missions to prove themselves 
and to be recorded for use in recruitment videos. And if they die in the field, they've, they've served a purpose that way. So, so they're being used in a lot of ways in, in highly expendable situations. They're being exploited in a lot of ways. But this is nothing new. We're seeing this now in Syria and Iraq, but the same things happened in Spain. Uh, there were American volunteers who, who were told, oh good, now that you're here, uh, go ahead and charge that, that uh, opposition post and you'll serve as an inspiration to Spanish troops. This is something that's consistent. We see always in every single case, we see uh, schisms, we see divisions erupt between the foreign fighters and the local fighters and the local populations that they're supposedly there to protect. In a lot of cases, the foreign fighters who arrive say that the locals aren't trying hard enough, that they're lazy, that they're not committed to the cause. And again, going back to some of these cases in, in Mexico 200 years ago, locals say that the foreign fighters are, are fanatics who are there for some abstract cause, uh, who don't appreciate their day-to-day -day realities, who, who tell them to worry about points of ideological or religious doctrine, uh, that when they have to worry about protecting their families. Um, and, and you see complaints made, you're seeing this of course today in, in Iraq and in Syria, but you could see this in Texas in the 1830s. There are complaints made by locals that the, the fighters who come in for the reasons of protecting the women of the community actually uh, are worse than, than the, the people who are fighting against them in, in, in terms of being uh, abusing. One thing that we're seeing today with people who have returned to countries like Indonesia, uh, but also some, some European countries, we're seeing something that was never documented in the past, but it is very obvious today, and that's high rates of post-traumatic stress disorder. There are people who are in, in, I have colleagues in Indonesia who are working with, in prisons with people who are unable to be put on trial because they're so psychologically damaged from their experiences in, in Syria and Iraq. They, they'll need extensive rehabilitation before anybody can even think about legal consequences. So the, this element of PTSD, there are social costs to communities that will continue with returnees for a long time to come. One thing that we see across cases is that even when groups win, most of the fighters don't stay there. Even when they've succeeded in bringing about a new government or a new state that they were fighting for, most of them go home. They even have gone back to their, their old jobs if their employers have held them for them. This is something that's changed a bit in recent decades for, for reasons I'll talk about in a minute, but that this seems to be a consistent pattern. Even today, the estimates are that while well, one-third have been killed in Syria, one-third have returned to home countries already from, from Iraq and Syria. Looking at the cases throughout history, we see that some fighters have stayed loyal to their cause for, for decades. In the Spanish case, for 70 years afterwards, they're still attending rallies uh, on behalf of Marxist causes to, co to commemorate what they did. But that many of them, because of their experiences in the field, become incredibly critical of the movements. They say, this is not what I thought I was fighting for. I, I was betrayed. And, and there's, there's something that can be done about that, I think, that would be useful. But those who remain loyal to the cause, we find, are very effective recruiters of other foreign fighters. They have the credibility of having gone there and participated in the conflict. They're seen as heroes in their local communities. They also know the right people to, to help make it easier to get to the battlefield. But most of them do not engage in militant attacks in their home countries after they've returned. There have been a few studies of this in recent years, uh, and, and we're looking in the historical cases that I've examined and some of the studies with, with return jihadis uh, since the 1980s are that maybe 5% become involved in, in uh, domestic terrorist plots, but a lot of those cases are simply po possessing offensive material. They're not, they're not violent activities. So, you know, I, I worked in government a long time ago. I, I don't do it anymore. Uh, the threat is greater than zero. It's, it's easy for me to talk about theory. The, the threat is greater than zero, but still, it's, it's, we're talking about a relatively small number. So it's worth considering that when we talk about uh, what laws are necessary to, to stop returnees from coming back to their countries. So what do we do about the problem today posed by Daesh and other groups? I, I presented a number of different causes, religious, ethnic, ideological, and I, I never try to draw a moral equivalence between them. I never say that one is as good or as bad as another, only that there are similar patterns. And I think this is the case with people who become involved in ideological politics that have nothing to do with political <laughs> violence directly. 
you have young people who go off sincerely uh, to join Daesh, who, who believe that they are fighting against injustice in the world, who want to make the world a better place. And, and here's a movement that says it's really the only movement that's directly fighting against you know, international Western capitalism right now. <laughs> But just a couple of years ago, I had students uh, who asked me for permission to leave class for weeks at a time to go join the Occupy movement because they said they wanted to be part of history. They were going to fight against injustice in the world. They were going to change the world and make it a better place. And, and they went away. They went away from their home communities and, and, and stayed with, with people that they didn't even know for weeks at a time. And you know, in Western countries, this is nothing new. You can, you can go back to the 1960s with, with, with some of the, the social movements. Uh, you know, the idea of telling young women, don't, don't go off with strangers, don't go engage in activities where you can be exploited, they didn't listen 50 years ago. Young people aren't, aren't going to listen to government public service announcements about risky behavior, uh, but they will listen to peer-to-peer -peer messages, and, and that's something I want to talk about in a minute. The unique thing about what Daesh is offering with, with a, a caliphate, with the chance to build a new society, to have a role in it, to be respected, something that they offer. I think there's one historical precedent for this as well, which has not been studied, and I'm looking for people with expertise in this to work with me on this project. And that is 100 years ago, at the end of World War I, uh, based on the very small amount of records I can find, you had 50,000 foreign volunteers come to the new Soviet Union in the name first of fighting to establish a, a Marxist state, but then in staying to build a new, what they saw as fair and just communist society on earth. We don't know what happened to them. I, I can't find records about them. But we know that many of them stayed permanently. Uh, we know that some of them were, that they were never trusted because the Soviet Union sent some of them to be the very first fighters in Spain in the 1930s. But, but there is this record of people who came not just to fight, but to build a new society. And perhaps we can learn from that once, once the records are collected. There are other cases that, again, would seem to have nothing to directly to do with the problem with Daesh. But I think that provides some cause for optimism. In the United States in the 1990s, uh, there were programs to stop young people, urban youth, from joining street gangs. The, they provided them with alternative programs, uh, but with sports leagues, basketball, uh, and other cases, other activities where they could meet people from outside their immediate communities, and where they could build a sense of identity with people whom they did not have an immediate connection with, but that would be different than the people in their community who only joined gangs. That would give them a sense of, of some sort of social identity, to give them a sense that they were appreciated and, and uh, respected for doing something other than just criminal activity. The studies we have show that crime rates in the United States fell fastest in the 1990s in the cities that had these midnight basketball leagues. So there is some evidence of their effectiveness. And I think these type of social organizations, these civic organizations, are actually the, the best way to address the problem long term. Uh, before people leave, before they, they, that we have to worry about returnees, we need to address the problem for future generations, potential future recruits. Uh, the, the now form, former Prime Minister of Australia made the argument he didn't want people going, and Australia is at a high rate of, of, of people going to, to fight with Daesh. Uh, he didn't want people going there. He wanted to join what he called Team Australia. And you know this is a good sentiment, but I, but I believe that joining Team any country uh, cannot be a conscious choice. It has to be something that people already feel. They already have to feel connected to their society. So how do we do this? Well, I think there are a few different policy considerations to conclude about how we uh, address the problem of people who have already gone to fight in, in Syria and Iraq, uh, what we do about returnees, and, and also how we stop people from going in the future. The first is that a number of countries in the past couple of years have responded to the threat of domestic terrorism by returnees by promoting very harsh legislation that would strip citizenship that would bar people from returning. And I would argue that history shows us that this is a mistaken policy. As I mentioned before, going back for 200 years, there are very few instances, historically, of people who have returned and become terrorists. Uh, in many cases, they simply reintegrate, they go back to their old jobs if they're available to them. 
But after Afghanistan in the 1980s, uh, a number of governments said that they did not want their citizens coming back with combat experience. They prevented them from returning, and, and they left them out to their own devices. Um, and, and what happened was they simply moved to other conflicts and gained more experience and gained more recruits. They went from Afghanistan to Bosnia uh, and on to other conflicts, Chechnya, the Philippines, Algeria. Osama bin Laden, to me, is exhibit A of what happens when you strip citizenship and simply say, this is someone else's problem now. Don't come back. So what do we have to do? Well, with returnees, again, the, the numbers who are engaged in militant politics are small. Uh, some countries recently, Denmark is one example, who have taken the, the, an opposite attitude that you should welcome back returnees that you should give them rehabilitation programs, uh, job training skills to help them lead a normal life, the same way that a lot of these governments treat uh, people involved in militant politics with you know, um, right-wing groups, uh, racist groups. They give them those same sort of services, and they're, they're doing it now with returned fighters from Iraq and Syria. One, um, one thing that matters, as I mentioned before, especially with millennial generation, young people. It's that the most effective messages come from their peers. If we allow people to return to their home countries instead of keeping them out, we actually are importing the most effective possible spokesman against going off to fight because people will come back, most of them with the experience of, of, of having been exploited, of, of, you know, of, of seeing strife that they weren't expecting, that fighting people they thought they were there to defend. and. Uh, you know, in the United States, we take people who have been convicted of dr uh, drunk driving. And even if they've killed someone, we send them into schools to talk to young people about the mistakes they made because it's believed that this will be a more effective warning than any government announcement about, about dangerous behavior. So for somebody who, who genuinely wants to reintegrate into society and is willing to cooperate, as willing to perform a kind of community service, uh, I think this is actually the most effective thing that we can do. The most effective form of counter message is by somebody who has the credibility of having gone themselves and can say, "This I was there, this is what really happened. Because along those lines, threatening people with punishment, threatening them with, with, with jail time, is not going to stop them from going to Iraq and Syria. Because we know that foreign fighters are always recruited by a message that they are under threat anyway. If you threaten them and say, we, we will penalize you, it's only going to confirm to them that there is a threat and that they need to act sooner rather than later before the problem gets worse. So again, it's a lengthy process. It's something that has to be done to prevent future fighters. But if, if we can work to get them integrated into other organizations that give them a sense of, of national pride, uh, they will have less reliance on, on, on these non-state groups to tell them that you don't worry about your country. And I, th I think this country has done a very good job uh, of, of building a set institutions that give people a sense of national pride and, and opportunity to, to be a part of their country. And I think that's a, a model that uh, much of the rest of the world can learn from. And with that, I, I thank you, and I, I look forward to having a discussion about these issues. Thank you. presented tonight uh, I think extremely uh, beneficial especially the uh, the mention to the history which we need to go deep in that history and benefit from it uh, I've just a couple of questions very quick uh, we should about recent history now in Daesh uh, the first question is uh, from your analysis and uh, study of the cases and so on what is the trend now of the recruitment is it uh, upward or downward uh, so it will give us some sort of indication of what's going on in the market. Uh, the second question is, again, I mean, uh, it's, it's very natural that the recruitment then comes the retention. Uh, what's, again, the retention uh, uh, direction, I would say, uh, in, in, in the pattern of that uh, retention? Uh, I know it's uh, very little, maybe, uh, cases of the retention uh, uh, analysis and figures, but 
just from your uh, analysis and from your information that you have. And thank you very much. في البداية أود أن أشكر مؤسسة طابا على هذه المحاضرة الطيبة وعلى دعوتهم الكريبة متمنين لهم النجاح المستمر في مثل هذه الفعاليات وكذلك أود أن أشكر الدكتور على محاضرته الرائعة أيضا لدي في الحقيقة يعني بعض ال it's it's more of comments and probably one or two questions but I will speak in Arabic so the rest of the group can... I, I feel like I can present myself in my language much better than other language. I think that in the discussion about these universities and the development of these girls, this is the hour. And I thank you for your interest in this issue. لكن يجب أعتقد أن نحن نفكر وأنت يعني يعني while you are presenting أنا أفكر في يعني مجموعة من الأسئلة يمكن السؤال الأول اللي الذي تبادر إلى ذهني مفهوم الهوية والانتماء الوطني الذي لم يعد يعني محصورا في المكان الذي يتربى فيه الشخص نحن يعني نتربى ونولد في دولة الإمارات وبالتالي إحنا مواطنين إماراتيين هويتنا وانتماءنا كذا أصبح بالنسبة لهذه الجماعات مفهوم الهوية مختلف ومفهوم الوطنية مختلف أنا أتي عبر القارات حتى أنتسب إلى جماعة وأحمل يعني هويتها وأصبح يعني انتمائي لها ودفاعي عنها وليس عن وطني الأم عن أرضي الذي تربيت فيها مما يعني مما يدللنا إن يعني في نظام العولمة الحدود لا تتهاوى أمام البضائع ورؤوس الأموال ولكن أيضا أمام القيم فالقيم أيضا ترحل من مكان إلى آخر في هذه الحالة وأيضا البشر يرحلون من أجل قيم معينة يأتي لكي يضرب أو يحمل السلاح في العراق أو في أفغانستان أو في غير غير وهذه أعتقد في في الحقيقة قضية جدا خطيرة يجب أن ننتبه لها أيضا وجود هذا العدد الذي أعتقد أنه كبير من هؤلاء الشباب الذي يعانون من المرض النفسي والنرجسية بشكل خاص كما ذكرت في في ورقتك نحن نعرف أن النرجسية أو نارسيزم يعني هو سيكولوجيكال ديزيز لكن قد يعني نسبة بسيطة من البشر يصابون به ولكننا أرى هذا العدد والعدد الذي هو في حالة تزايد يصاب بهذا هذا يخليني أفكر في النسق الثقافي الاجتماعي الذي ولد وتربى في هذا الشخص والذي جعل منهم أنهم يكونون شخصيات نرجسية فبالتالي هذا يعيدنا إلى أن أنا بدل ما أطرح الحلول في كيفية أن أنا أعيد أعيد مرة أخرى أعيدهم إلى بلادينهم أو أن أنا أقدم لهم أشكال من من العلاجات النفسية وغيره وغيره أتصور نحن يجب أن نحن ندرس ونفكر ما هو السياق الذي أفرزهم ونعالج السياق قبل أن نفكر كيف ممكن أن نعالجهم هم لأنهم في النهاية ليسوا يعني نبتات عشوائية خرجت في هذه الأرض هم أبناء سياق معين أبناء منظومة تعليمية منظومة ثقافية منظومة اجتماعية فما هي هذه المنظومة التي أدت إنها تنتج مثل هؤلاء البشر الشباب هم وقود أي تغيير وعندما نقول يعني وقود الوقود هو في صفة الاحتراق لأنهم عندهم الاستعداد للمغامرة وللحركة وللتغيير ولكذا ويمكن في الوطن العربي ككل النسبة الأعلى من البوبوليشن هم من الشباب أساسا فبالتالي أتصور أنه من الضرورة جدا أن نحن يعني نرجع إلى السياق وإلى التعليم بالدرجة الأولى وما يعني التعليم هو ليس منهج ولكن التعليم هو أسلوب حياة والمفروض أن يكون كذلك حتى نستطيع أن نحن فعلا هذا الوقود اللي هو الشباب نوظف التوظيف الأفضل والأمثل من خلال برامج مختلفة ومن خلال مؤسسات مختلفة ومن خلال أشياء كثيرة ولا فقط ننتظر أن متى يعني ينحرف هذا الشخص حتى أستطيع أنا مرة أخرى أعيد تعديل سلوكه ألاحظ النقطة الأخيرة فقط ألاحظ الفنون مهمة أيضا في تدريب يعني شغل أوقات الفراغ بالذات الفراغ الفكري بأشياء إيجابية خلال القراءة هذه كلها حلول معروفة وممارسة ولكن أعتقد قبل أن نفكر 
في الحل بعد الانحراف يجب أن نفكر في كيف نمنع الانحراف في داخل البيئة الثقافية والاجتماعية يعني نريد أن نظهر من إطار النظرية الوظيفية الفانكشنال ثيوري اللي هي تقول أن السيستم صحيح مهما كان ودائما يعني we are blaming the victim Thank you, uh, Dr. David, for uh, this historical, I think, overview of um, youth as uh, Dr. Mona said, um, fuel to, to changes in a lot of places. I think by mentioning Spanish uh, Revolution, you sort of shed a light on, on something very important to make some sort of connection with what's happening nowadays. Uh, but I guess with a different thing, I remember how much we read about the Spanish uh, Revolution and how many people, special people who got engaged in it, like uh, Frederico Garcia uh, Lorca, or uh, you mentioned Ernest Hemingway, or, or a lot of writers who were there who praised that uh, war, I think, and also glamorized it. Now it's done in, in a different way through what you have mentioned, uh, in, in new media. I guess I will uh, build upon what uh, Dr. Mona has said first. And I was sort of trying to connect. Now we're talking about society like, for example, the, the European society or America and people who went from there to fight. And I was wondering also, because you have mentioned a lot of important issues, especially when you say youth are in search of recognition. And I think there where we see also the punks people who were seeking recognition. There we can also trace the people who go for drugs. Yeah. It is the same. What drives people to, to, to go to the extreme uh, attitude or extreme behavior is something within. So I think do we need to, to look into those societies in terms of how much justice they provide for their citizens? Places like, for example, the United States, I remember as a student of uh, mass media, I was reading once an article arguing against the point that TV makes people more violent. The writer was saying, you are talking about a violent society because the United States was built on violence. So I think this is th these are all accumulating factors that led people to, to what they are now. When we say also Daesh in Iraq and this is a war against Sunnah and Shia, we also trace the presence of the United States there and what is left behind to create the situation. We, kn we have known Iraq before the invasion and Sunnah and Shia was not the same as they are now. So I think there are other factors that play important role in, in making these youth. Sometimes they are driven with, with what they feel like uh, uh, extreme uh, noble values that they are going to fight for. And of course they sort of collapse after they are seeing the reality of it. So I think it's, it's I, I was wondering when you said Denmark, how many people from Denmark went? Can we trace that to say, because I, for, for me I guess Denmark is more, there are more just in Denmark than it is in the United States. I lived in the United States for a while. 15 years, I guess, and I know the society very well. And I have seen a lot of youth driven into drugs or driven into crimes or driven, so it's the same. Do we blame the youth or do we blame societies that drives youth to, to go to this extreme? Thank you very much. Sorry, I have spoken in... Sorry, I have spoken in English, but I have to go to the end. Dr. Abdullah Sheba from the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research. First of all, on behalf of Dr. Jamal San Swedi, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Ali, for this kind invitation and for Taba Foundation. Dr. David, thank you very much for this uh, lecture. And actually, your lecture has raised a confusion for me in our, from our perspective. On one side, the West, the youth there, they live a free life, free internet, uh, high levels of education. Uh, you know, freedom in, in their life. Terrorists, 
groups, they are operational in our lands, in the Arab world. But we have, for decades, many countries in the Arab world, they don't practice or they don't perform democracy. So depression is there among our youth. We don't have the same level of education quality as you have. We have high levels of unemployment rates. But when we see the scene there in Daesh or other groups, we see thousands of youth coming from your area or the free country, and instead of going from our area to them. So how would you explain this dilemma? Thank you. Thank you for the, the first round of questions. Uh, very good questions, um, and I will do my best to, to give answers that do justice to them. They're very complex issues. Uh, in terms of the numbers going, I, I've, had meeting, I've had a few different meetings in the past year uh, from different governments, from different international agencies like the United Nations, and uh, they always say the numbers are higher than anybody reports publicly. Uh, you know, they, they tell the researchers who, who I know who work on these issues, your numbers aren't, aren't high enough, that they need to be higher, uh, that the rates are continuing to increase. At the same time, a, a lot of them then use the numbers that the researchers give as, as the basis for it. But, but, but every country, almost every country, Denmark is an exception, and I'll talk about that in a second, most countries say that their numbers are continuing to increase. Uh, very few say that they're going down. And, and, and uh, the statistics that I've heard are that, you know, Australia right now, they say maybe one, one third have, have returned. Um, m many stay only for a few weeks or, or a few months, and then they leave. So, and whether, how disillusioned they are, uh, if, if they only stay a short time because they're disillusioned, uh, or simply because they're frightened, or, or who knows what, we, we don't know, because a lot of people are not willing to speak about their experiences because they're afraid of, of legal troubles. So again, that, that's a reason why it's hard for people in the research sector uh, to get information about what's happening is because people are afraid of, of prosecution. So that, that you, can, you understand why there are laws uh, you know, trying, to, trying to stop terrorism, but it makes my job harder in, in trying to get a, a, an accurate picture. Um, There, there's an argument to be made, you know, there, there's a, an old expression that if you're holding a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And uh, political scientists like me and, and psychologists and, and sociologists, we all have different approaches to how we study participation in, in terrorist groups. Um, I had a professor once who was a psychologist, uh, was very famous in that field, who, who said that everything the only reason that people join militant groups is because of psychological problems. And he said, he, he used this expression that uh, the cause is not the cause. That, that what they say they're fighting for is not the real reason that, that they're fighting. So I, I think there's an argument to be made, uh, whether it's at the individual level or whether it's at the social level, that, that people are victims of, of societies that, that aren't meeting their, their needs. Um, it, it's something that's certainly being debated right now. Um, there, I was, I was, we were talking about this uh, in another meeting this morning, that there are some, uh, some sociologists who, who make the argument that, you know, maybe even 5% of human beings in the world are, are sociopathic, that they, you know, would have criminal indifference to the sufferings of any other human being, and if you give them any, oper they, they'll engage in antisocial behavior no matter what happens. So you could say that there are some people who, uh, are right now who are fighting for Daesh who would be involved in criminal gangs, you know, in, involved in crime, and now they have people telling them, do the things that you want to do anyway and you'll be a hero for it. And that might be why uh, the, the representative from Iraq was asking, why are people from the Western countries who are coming being so much more brutal than, than, than local fighters? Um, and another reason, though, is that, they're, as I mentioned, they're being held up as examples. They're put on, on social media as ways to recruit, to show uh, the legitimacy of these groups, that the message has changed away from we have outside supporters, so we're weaker, we're not as legitimate to look at us, we have outside supporters, we must be a strong group that everybody wants to join. So it, it's simply that they're being showcased more. 
as well. Um, the, the points about um, uh, you know some of the Western societies, the rates for Denmark. Denmark is one of those countries that says that its rate has fallen recently. They, they and they say it's because we have these social rehabilitation programs that uh, not only help people when they come back, but those people are able to come back and speak openly about their experiences, and this discourages others from going. That that could be true. It make, that's an argument that I, I think makes sense. That's what I would do. Uh, but at the same time, I, I know, and again, I met with some here a couple of days ago, but I've heard from people in, in countries, in Scandinavian countries that do this, that within those countries, these are very controversial policies. That you have a lot of opposition that say, you're giving money to terrorists, you're, you're letting people back in who make our society unsafe, and they know that all it takes is one failure, and, and these policies will probably be gone. Uh, but there are some countries that say their rates have fallen as a, as a result of these policies. Uh, you know, the, it, it's hard for me to make arguments about, um, you know, ab about the social fabric. Certainly, I, I agree with some of your points that, that violence is something that's been glorified in American history. Uh, it goes back to a revolution against the British, and you know, uh, it's one reason I think for high gun rates. There is, there is something to that. Um, but you know. You, you have cases also, as I've mentioned, where, where people have come to America from, from countries, and from uh, Scandinavian countries, you know, 150, 200 years ago to fight. Uh, some of them were involved in, in militant politics in Europe that were going on at the time in, in, in the 1830s. So uh, some people who are political scientists make the argument that it's, it's simply about opportunities. If you have instances where there are uh, weak states, where, where governments are not able to stop groups that use violence that will attract people who, who are looking, uh, whether they're looking for money or whether they're looking just to fight, they'll be drawn to these, these situations. So it, it, in a, a lot of ways, it's a problem. Uh, you say globalization, it's a problem of, of global governance that, that in some ways uh, areas where this happens are, are become threats to other countries as well. So they need coordinated responses. And uh, you know, also the point about uh, you know the, the the point that was made about uh, you know Western youth and and, and democracy. This, this is a good question, and there was an argument that was made in the last decade. You know, after um, after the 9/11 attacks during the Iraq War, that if you had more democratization in in Arab countries, that this would solve the problem. And uh, the, the argument was made that people are not able to engage in in you know, and they're they're looking at the Brotherhood. Uh, that people who are not able to engage in politics and change the system in their home countries because the government is too strong go to weak countries like Afghanistan where they can, where they can fight. And this is an argument that you saw in the historical cases. There, there were people who were involved in, in workers' parties in America in the 1930s who said the when, I would, when I would protest, the police would beat me, but I can go to Spain and I can put a gun in my hand because there's no one to stop me. Um, if, and that was an argument that made sense to me at the time, but what we've seen actually is, is that some of the countries like, like Tunisia that have been, had the most democracy introduced in the past couple of years also have the highest rates of, of fighters in Syria and Iraq. So the, 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 it doesn't seem as clear cut to me anymore uh, of a link between opportunity to participate in democracy uh, and, and whether people look to go elsewhere. trying to eliminate these groups from the, uh, from the ground. Uh, and if, go if the governments are not really willing to do that, do you think there should be some kind of non-governmental organizations doing that? And how can we support these uh, uh, non-governmental organizations? Thank you. Again, thank you, doctor, for such a for this informative presentation. My um, statement is more a comment rather than a question. Um, as you mentioned some very important points that I think should be emphasized. And one has to do with the idea that there is a perceived existential threat. That the messaging has to do with a defensive posture rather than an aggressive one. That's one point. The other has to do with the notion of the transnational sens sensibility. The uh, people that are recruited have a sense that they are involved, uh, are engaged in a transnational connectedness with an ideology, which undermines their loyalty to their own nation state. So it's transnational. 
The other has to do uh, with um, the, the idea, and I think this is something that I, I'm paying particular attention to and it may connect with the other person's question, around the idea of, of uh, the profile of those individuals who are more receptive to being um, recruited. 20 years old, in their 20s, young, often alienated from society, and particularly in the Western world, uh, in, our, in America, coming from America, working in the Islamic community there, the people who are, pro, who are, who are uh, prone to radical, radicalization, people who come out of prisons, alienated from society, broken families, feel alienated from American society because of racism and marginality, and they become prime suspects to be recruited. So I think those are the, and finally, the idea of preventive measures and how one deals with the returnees. This is, this is extremely uh, important in terms of strategy. And the strategy around how do you prevent someone from coming, I think the, and, and I think uh, one of the uh, sisters mentioned this, the idea that the people are miseducated Islamically. There's a failure in our system in terms of educating our people in terms of Islam that someone can come and give them this distorted picture of Islam and they buy into it thinking that this is really Islam. So the Islamic educational piece becomes critical in terms of preventive. And finally, the strategy of returnees. When people are returning, then as you mentioned, I think, in your research, in your work, the importance of a punitive measures be very careful with punitive measures because it just uh, substantiates the notion that there's a threat. But then in the returnees, there should be some process of uh, re-entry into society, a sense of national consciousness, civil engagement, so that they can feel a part of the society and not alienated and welcomed back into society, particularly young people who really don't have knowledge of what they're really dealing with in the first place. Well, well, thank you for those questions. Um, <clears throat> well, one, one main point I, sh I should address, I guess, with both of those questions is the role of governments in supporting, you know, in, in supporting foreign fighter movements, uh, both, both promoting them and also stopping them. And you know, I, I mentioned earlier that, that rebel groups like to get outside help because they're not strong. And, and if you look at all of these cases, there has been one degree or another of, of government support helping these groups, whether it's directly financing them and arming them, uh, or whether it's simply looking the other way and allowing recruitment to happen in the country. Uh, cases where you've had counteraction, you know, if you, again, the Spanish case is very well documented. At one point, France just simply said, we're, we're closing the border and we're, we're policing the border to make sure nobody gets across anymore. And that, that almost stopped. Of course, Spain is also geographically, there's a lot of water surrounding Spain, so it's going to depend on the circumstances. Um, but, but certainly, there, there's a government role. And uh, you know, one example, we were talking a little bit last night about, about African Americans who fought in, in the Spanish Civil War. And countries can try to advance their, their political, their international political objectives by, by promoting foreign fighter recruitment. So in that case, uh, the Soviet Union was directly behind the, the Communist International. And they made, they made a very direct effort, and they weren't, they weren't Muslim, they, they were Christian, but they made a direct effort to recruit African Americans, uh, I think there were a hundred in, in the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, uh, by saying that the rise of fascism is going to threaten black people in America. So you have to act now. And they also made the argument, though, that if you defeat fascism in Spain, you will weaken Italy enough to end its invasion of Ethiopia. So it was actually seen as defensive. You can defend what was presented as the cradle of black civilization in, in the West by, by fighting in Spain. They said this. The way, the way to free Ethiopia is on the battlefields of Spain. So you will always find governments with their own objectives who see an opportunity to advance their cause. By, it's always about framing. It's always how they present the conflict. Who is threatened? What is at stake? This is politics. And, and then there's always a way to present it. In, in some new way that will try to get somebody else involved in it. Uh, the idea, the point about non-state actors, I, I think is a very good one because, and this was the point I was trying to make about civil society groups as well, that education is important and governments, it, it's not, in, in many of these cases, it's not, perhaps not the role of government or a government is not going to be trusted, 
that tries to tell people, try, vulnerable populations, this is what your religion says, this is what your, your ethnic identity is supposed to be. Uh, and it, it's community institutions that can fill that void and that can hopefully give people positive strength uh, so that they're not vulnerable. Because really, as I see it, that, that, you know, again, whether there's some causes that, that are more, some causes that we, you know, of all of these different causes in 200 years, some of them are easier to support than others. Uh, but the tactics that are used by the recruiters, e even in cases where I say, okay, they're fighting for something that makes sense, um, it's the same tactics that are used by, by gangs, the same tactics that are used by religious cults, and, uh, you know, this is, this is not something I think anybody wants their children usually. Some, some families are very supportive of causes. A lot of times parents turn in, will call the police to keep their kids from becoming foreign fighters if they think that's happening. We've seen that even, you know, 100, 100 years ago. So the, the, tactics, the tactics that are used for recruitment are usually very exploitive. And that's something where civil society groups, NGOs, uh, can step in and fill a void. دكتور ديفيد مالي وعلى هذه المحاضرة القيمة